Today, we are back at John Kufleitner's to take a look at this 1939 Ford half-ton truck. This truck is for sale, so the link will be in the description. Psst, we get to drive this one too. But before getting into this one, I am Jay. Welcome to What It's Like. This channel, we feature the classics, vintage, some exotics, lots of orphan cars. This channel is a go-to channel for cars that are off the beaten path. Cars that are overlooked from yesteryear will get a review on this channel. If that sounds of interest to you, subscribe and hit the bell icon next to it to never miss a video. Now, we are going to do an end of the year episode. It's gonna air December 31st for the end of the year, right? Very fitting. Anyway, if you have any questions, comments, concerns, just voice your opinions in the comments section below and I will answer any questions that you have on that episode for the end of the year. If you like and dig this channel, please give this video a like. It helps more people see this video in the future. 1939 was a big year for Ford. It was the introduction of Mercury as a brand. 1939 Ford model lineup consisted of two models, the deluxe model, which was also known as 91A8, and the standard model known as 922A8. This is the weird model name period. All the automotive brands from this time period, for whatever reason, made some really, really weird model name choices. Anyway, the standard model came in four body styles, coupe, two-door sedan, four-door sedan, five-passenger wagon. The deluxe came in three or five-passenger convertible, coupe, two-door sedan, four-door sedan, and wagon. Then there was the trucks. Ford offered a plethora of truck options from the half ton being the smallest going all the way up. They even offered a co or cab over design. I believe 1939 was the first year for Ford to offer the co. Anyway, it doesn't really matter because we are here for the half ton truck. 1939 Ford half ton was essentially a carryover design from 1938 with very subtle changes. Fun fact, the new front end design featured the very first traditional front opening hood. Everything up to this point was butterfly hinged, as in both sides would open. Both the cab and the bed grew in size for the very first time since 1931. 1939 also saw the addition of hydraulic brakes. I just found out about that because I always thought Ford introduced the hydraulic brakes in 1936. This truck design only lasted two years, 1938 and 1939. Moving on to specs, it rides a wheelbase of 112 inches. It weighs 2,700 pounds. The cargo bed dimensions are 77.7 .7 inches long, 46 inches wide. It has a depth of 22.2 inches. Price was $570, which is equivalent to you spending $12,171 in the year 2022. If you're going to buy one of these cars today, according to Haggerty, the highest priced 1939 Ford half-ton truck was $121,000. The lowest was $14,080. The most recent is $40,700. Number three condition, according to them, is $24,900. And what is a number three condition car, you might ask? Runs, drives well, but it has flaws, but the flaws aren't noticeable to any passer buyers. Options on the 39 Ford, oil bath, air cleaner, oil filter, oversized tires, rear bumper, heavy duty clutch, Road lamps, governor, sliding rear window, hot water heater. That was a big one for 1939. Dual wipers, radio, locking gas cap. Ford also offered the deluxe package, which chrome plated everything like the windshield itself. Wipers, view mirror, grill, body colored wheel covers, deluxe passenger hubcaps. Moving on to engines, of which there are three. In the basement, 136 cubic inch displacement flathead V8, 2.2 liters. A little bit about this engine. This engine was introduced in 1937 and was produced until 1941. It was replaced by the 226 straight six in America. It produced 60 horsepower at 3,500 RPM, 94 foot pounds of torque at 2,500 RPM with a bore of 2.6 inches and a stroke of 3.2 inches, compression 6.6 .6 to one. With this engine, you had a 444 rear end with an option to opt for a 411. Moving to the next engine, 221 cubic inch displacement, flathead V8, 3.6 liters. A little bit of background on this engine. This was the original flathead V8. The block is cast as a single piece. 
This engine was introduced in 1932 and was produced until 1936 as like the original design. 37 and 38 saw revisions of this engine. This engine was produced from 1932 to 1938 with 21 head bolts. By 1938, they introduced another revision of this V8. It was called the V881A, but it's often referred to as the 24 stud. 85 horsepower at 3,800 RPM, 150 foot-pounds of torque at 2,000 RPM, with a bore of 3.062 inches and a stroke of 3.75 inches. Compression was 621 to 1 with a two-barrel carburetor downdraft style. This one came with a 378 rear end with the option to opt for the 411. This engine was used through 1942. Moving to the last engine on offer, brand new for 1939, 239 cubic inch displacement flathead V8 3.9 liters. And I was on the fence of whether or not to include this or not because it was originally a Mercury engine, but I saw conflicting information across the board. Some sources said that you could get this in a Ford truck and others said that it wasn't available in a Ford truck until the 40s. But anyway, V8 99A, had a production run from 1939 to 1953 in the U.S., but it lasted until 1954 in Canada. Produced 95 horsepower, 170 foot-pounds of torque, bore of 3.1875 inches, stroke of 3.75 inches, compression was 6.15 to 1. Only one transmission on offer, three-speed manual. Let's talk front-end styling. Just check out all the stuff that's going on up here and it's symmetrical meaning it's the same on both sides big lights nice horn fog lights and or parking running lights down here i believe that these were added on after the fact it might have been an accessory from the factory nice horns as well as big lights big opening it almost sort of looks like a play into bugattis underneath the hood now how do you get underneath the hood of this because generally all the trucks that came before this truck and had because bugatti handles had over here on the side and had a butterfly in the front hood but as you can see there is no hinge in the center here so it's not a butterfly style hood how do you access the hood there is no catch here the hood ornament is actually how you release it so it turns like this and then you use this as a handle to open it. Once it's open, there is a hood prop right here. And then it goes like that. Inside this engine compartment, it's got the flathead V8, but notice how far down the flathead sits inside the chassis. It is down there. In a modern car, the engine sits up higher, but down in this one, it sits down inside there. Let's talk about a few things. Carburetor there. Notice it's got a fuel bowl. It's an actual glass bowl, and that is your uh, fuel filter as well. It's got a generator on top. It's got a, it's a flathead V8, so it actually has two water pumps, one water pump on each bank of cylinders. One's right under behind here, and the other one's on the other side. There is a fuel filter. This They must have added a fuel filter going to the bowl after the fact. Generally, the bowl would act as your fuel filter back in the day. And just check out this radiator. Look at how both hoses go to the top. Battery. This one looks like it's been updated with a coil. I think all of these were started on Magneto, if it was, if I remember right. In the comments section below, did this use Magneto? I absolutely love the fenders on this and how it goes down into a running board here. And how the body is wider here. The body tapers out and then it goes right back in real fast. Wheel well here. There's a step plate if you needed to step on the running board, not to scratch the running board, to step right here to get into the bed. And here's what the bed looks like.
that's what the rear view window looks like and these come out too if you wanted them to come out gas filler cap is on the driver's side i absolutely love these fenders and how they like torpedo back absolutely gorgeous design coming to the rear back here it tells everybody that hey it's a ford and it's got a v8 i absolutely love these little tiny brake lights and this is how the bed operates back here so you take this off on both sides this side's really tight for some reason and then it just folds down so that is how the bed operates coming up and getting inside so just take a look at the door panel the door panel is made out of the same material the seats are made out of and the window goes all the way down the door is nice and framed in the whole way around just look at how thick that door is there's my finger for reference and it's like that the whole way around this is how the window operates and notice the shape No door handle, just cloth. Also notice the door opens 90 degrees. So just take a look at that. Easy access into this cab because the door opens 90 degrees. That's what it sounds like when you're shutting it. This is an over the hood impression absolutely love the over the hood impression you can see the hood you can also see a little bit of that light over there and you can also see the top of the fender here's what first person looks like there is lots of room underneath this steering wheel enough room to do that with my hand i just wanted to show you this so look at the steering wheel see how it moves but the center does not move also this moves to the left or to the right i originally thought that those were turn signals but this car does not sorry this truck does not have turn signals this is actually for the lights to turn the lights on or off is in the center and it, you can turn it on either left or right it doesn't matter which whichever way you want to do it there are no sun visors but there's lots of stuff to talk about with this windshield notice the windshield wiper is at the mounted at the top and the reason it's mounted at the top is because this windshield can crank out by turning this knob so see the windshield is cranking out that is one of my favorite features about this truck because when you're driving it it's almost like driving a motorcycle really with a steering wheel you're getting all the air into your face and cooling off it's really great not only does it have the crank out windshield but it also has the cow air scoop right be below it did you see that pop up so not only could you have the air blow in your face but you can also have it blow at your feet don't need air conditioning with those two on to the button switches and knobs this dashboard is pretty straightforward starting on the left and moving right that is the starter button remember it was located on the floor but it was relocated to that push button on the dashboard there are two gauge pods that sit in front of the driver on the left hand side most of the gauges are inside the one on the left hand side at the top is the oil pressure next is the battery at the bottom is the temperature gauge now just check out this temperature gauge and look at how it's designed it almost looks like they took it this right off the motometer which used to be at the top of the radiator like the radiator cap was on the outside of the car motometer stuck on top on top and as you're looking down the road you're always your eyes were always on the temperature this looks exactly like that only instead of it being on the outside of the car it's inside the car and then fuel gauge moving to the right speedometer notice 100 miles an hour i'm not entirely sure that this will go 100 miles an hour but this will track speeds up to 100 miles an hour it also has an odometer at the top of the needle and then just below the needle tripometer this one's the choke this one is throttle control watch i'm going to move this lever here and watch the gas pedal move did you see that 
So they work in unison. So this, you can run this as throttle control, as a hand throttle, which is super cool. You could almost set it like a primitive cruise control. There isn't a whole lot of space. I can touch the other side and I'm not even like leaning over. So there's enough space for another person inside here, but that would be about it. On to the glove box test. Here is our test subject. Here's my hand for reference. Here is the glove box in question. No problem. That one fits in there pretty easily. And glove box shuts. Also, Pro actually fits inside the glove box as well, and it shuts. So just check that out. The iPad won't fit in there. I have the iPad right here. It can fit in long ways, but it won't shut. Here's what I look like inside. Tons of headroom. Probably wear like a bowler hat while we're, while driving this. Starting procedure. So this is a lot like the 40 Ford. It has the same kind of key cylinder. So I'm gonna shut this off real quick. Here's what the key looks like. And you stick it in the cylinder like so, and it turns a whole revolution the opposite direction. You flip the switch to the on position, push the clutch in, starter button's over here. And it starts right up. There is a very annoying feature about this car when driving it. Check out the gas pedal. Look at how small it is. It is right next to where the starter button would be, but they put this starter button up on the dashboard so that when you're driving this with big feet, see, this is my foot. You almost have to drive it with your foot back here otherwise this so i just want to give you a better idea of what that's like so if you have the gas pedal pushed down and you have shoes like mine your shoe gets caught on that button so if you get a truck like this maybe you might want to take that button out if you relocated the starter button to somewhere else because it is very annoying when you're driving and your foot gets stuck and you can't get it out you have to slide it out like this because when it gets stuck like this it won't it doesn't come out that easily just pulling it out Driving the 39 Ford. It's a three speed stick shift non synchro mesh. Well, I shouldn't say that. First gear isn't synchronized, third and fourth seem to be. That means that you have the pit stop in the neutral whenever you downshift or upshift for that matter. I've driven this around the block a couple of times and I found out that when downshifting, you do have to double clutch. But if you're going forward, as long as the speed is right, it'll go in the gear. Okay, so I pit stopped in neutral there, up in the second. Started out in second there. I love how it clicks in the gear too. When you uh, put it in gear, it clicks. And a lot of old cars do that. This is a nice truck to just take the family, not the family, but you know, you can fit your daughter or your son or your wife. This is just a nice cruiser to just go to the pumpkin patch, pick up a couple pumpkins, go buy some corn at the local food mart. It's just a good old girl. It's not a speed demon. It's not, it wasn't built for that. It was built to you know, go get pumpkins, go get, go to the local produce stand and go get some produce. That would be the perfect truck for this.
Let's talk driving experience. This was not built for speed, and I have to correct myself from earlier. It's a three-speed, not a four-speed. I got confused because when I shifted it down, third gear is where fourth gear would be if it was a four-speed. Anyway, I love the way that this thing shifts, and the crazier thing is, is I have a friend that has a 53 Ford F3. His truck is the hardest thing that I have ever driven. Four-speed, non-synchro mesh, and he makes it look so easy, but when I tried to drive it, I wasn't good at it at all. His, you have to double clutch it and rev match. Anyway, this is so much easier to drive than that. And the shifts are smooth. The clutch works great. The brakes are kind of eh. But honestly, I think that was a Ford thing because in the 53, the brake pedal felt the exact same way. There isn't any resistance in the pedal and it sort of feels like a dead pedal almost like how a pedal feels when a brake line breaks in a modern car i think that's just the way they are plus one has to remember that this truck has hydraulic drum brakes but they are not self-adjusting if i remember correct the pedal feel is adjustable the brake pedal in my 52 chevy truck is firm and i barely have to touch the pedal to stop anyway I absolutely love the crank out windshield, but when you're at speed, so around 40 miles an hour, and say there's a truck on the other side of the road coming towards you, say a truck 18 wheeler is coming at you, 65 miles an hour is what he's going. I'm going 40 because that's all it's got. Truck blows past me at 65 miles an hour, and with it came the wind behind the truck, which effectively went through the windshield, making my truck into a giant sail. Anyway, it was an incredible experience when it happened because I felt the truck get pushed back as I was moving forward. It was the weirdest sensation in the world. But anyway, it's very important to point this out. If you have everything open, so say you have the windshield open, the cow vent open, and the two windows down, there is a lot of drag and it's very apparent. Like, it, it's just, it's crazy. Like, as soon as you open that windshield, it's like you could just feel a force. It, it just feels like you're playing tug of war with the elements, really. It, it's crazy, it's a crazy sensation. But I have to tell you one thing that this truck does amazing, and that is the turning radius. The turning radius in this truck is absolutely unbelievable. It's a really sharp turning truck. On to the pros and cons. I usually get all of the pros and cons from a book called The Complete Book of Collectible Cars, Blue Chip Auto Investment, 70 years from 1930 to 2000, but this truck isn't in there. So I've compiled my own list of Pros and cons. On the positive side, styling stood the test of time. I don't know about you, but these colors on this truck with the wide wall tires, the red accenting rims, and the fall leaves, this truck really pops. It's easy to drive, has a huge glove box, and it's simple. On the con side, the bed isn't wide enough for a sheet of plywood and or drywall. It isn't long enough either. The cab only has room for two adults from this time period. So 2022 size adults, there's only enough room for two of them and maybe a lap dog, maybe. The starter button is too close to the accelerator spoon. I mean pedal, but if you look at it, it does look like a spoon. Now it's time for name that tune, hint. It's not from the 1930s. First person to give me the correct name of the song and band will have their comment pinned to the top of the comment section. Thank you all so much for coming out and watching this. I really appreciate all of the support. And until next time, 